Well, thanks to everybody, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. So um, I'm going to do a couple things, uh, audience-friendly things. One is I'm going to spend less time than allocated on this talk, since it is late in the day. Yes. And the other thing I thought I'd do is throw in a few semi-obnoxious comments just to get some discussion going after my talk, or at least let's call them controversial topics. Um, and for those of you who are going to leave, I'll tell you the point of my talk right now. The, the synopsis is, is that the HEOR model in the US is broken. And the pricing model for pharmaceuticals is broken. And unless we as a community uh, figure out a way to use a health economics in our decision making, uh, we are not going to stop this train of unsupportable price increases uh, in, in pharma. So first I wanted to start with the definition which is what is health economics and outcomes research. I think everyone in the room probably has some sense of it. And actually, when I tried to find an official de definition, there was none. But I think this summarizes it. It's a multidisciplinary approach that is aimed at estimating value. So value usually includes cost and outcomes. Uh, and it includes th such things as looking at the budget impact of new technologies, uh, patient reported outcomes, practice patterns, comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness. And um, as I said, I went to the literature to see if I could find a, um, a nice synopsis of health economics and outcomes research. And I came across this article uh, by Arnie Epstein, who I, I uh, respect quite a bit. Uh, and he, he described it visually as a synthesis as epidemiology, clinical trials, effectiveness studies, psychometrics. Uh, drug and non-drug interventions, and way over here in the corner is pharmacoeconomics. Um, and then that is all to be synthesized into a disease management strategy, outcomes management, that with the end result of improved quality of life and patient outcomes. But my question was, where is the cost piece in all of this? He put it in at the end, it did not come in here. Um, so I, even though the title of this article is uh, a guide for the perplexed, I remain perplexed. Um, and I think this article is prescient, even though it was published uh, many years ago, in that we still treat health economics this way. When we talk about H-E-O-R, we really don't worry about the H-E, we're only talking about the O-R. And uh, the rest of my talk, which I said is going to be short, is really to try to convince you that unless we look at value, unless we look at cost, the OR is, is, is somewhat pointless because it, we're not going to be able to make good decisions and improve value for our patients until we take cost into account and what we get for what we pay. And the, the problem is, is that we continue to have ongoing discussions and debates about what outcomes are worth paying for, uh, but disconnecting that with the real issue that the price of what we're paying is going through the roof. So these are a few of the things in oncology that we discuss uh, and debate, and I go to ASCO most years and I hear debates about whether we should pay for symptom improvement, quality of life, this thing called progression-free survival, overall survival, and the latest thing that I've been told we need to pay for is the opportunity for cure. So again, these are all concepts that are reasonable uh, for debate, uh, but they are being discussed without the, without the context of the price we're paying. Um, and because of this, I think, indirectly because of this, uh, pharma and developers are responding uh, in two ways. One is by um, raising their prices to levels that are really unsupported, and I'll show some data on, on why I think that's true, but also trying to change the conversation of outcomes research to make it in their favor. Um, and this is a study that was published just to sort of support that uh, a couple or last year in Journal of Clinical Oncology, Oncology interestingly by a Canadian group. I, I, it'd be interesting to see if an American group would ever do this. And what it looked at was among randomized control trials that were published over, the, over several decades, what proportion used um, survival as an endpoint uh, in oncology 
and what, you, what proportion use progression-free survival. Now remember, progression-free survival is typically defined by radiographic progression over time in patients who are being treated. It may or may not correlate with symptoms. It may or may not correlate with survival. But because it is easy to measure, um, and we have the tools in, in all of our systems to measure it, it, it's almost universally measured in clinical trials. And what this group pointed out is that over time, the proportion of studies that use progression-free survival as the primary endpoint went from zero in the 80s to more than a quarter of all trials uh, in the early 2000s. And interestingly, if you look at randomized control trials in the palliative setting, uh, the proportion that, that use progression-free survival as a primary endpoint went from zero to 45% of all trial, all studies. And again, if we, you know, if progression-free survival correlated precisely with patient quality of life or with overall survival, that might make sense to me. But we know from multiple studies that that is a very inconsistent relationship, uh, and we're getting away from measuring things that I think patients value the most. And the author said it here, um, is this really an advance for patients if we improve progression-free survival? Um, or is it just lowering the bar um, so that we can declare you know, a much new, much heralded new molecular targeted therapy as the next best thing? And I, as I said, I go to ASCO meetings every year where we have plenaries that show this type of information and uh, are, are, you know, show a progression-free survival increase of six months, 12 months, and this is heralded as a breakthrough, and practices change. Now, stepping back from that and going to an airpoint that I think is less controversial, overall survival, it is true that in many cancers we are showing real gains in real progress over time in improving survival in patients with advanced cancers. And this is an example from a study published looking at gains in median overall survival um, based on clinical trial data for patients with advanced metastatic uh, colorectal cancer. And uh, since the 90s up through 2008, we had a, a gain um, of from about eight months to 18 months. You know, so a 10-month improvement, which is, uh, I think, most people would agree, uh, real progress. But that ignores the issue of the cost of those therapies. And this is a plot uh, that I put together. This is not a cost-effectiveness plot, but this is a plot where I looked at the most used regimens that have been uh, adopted over the years, and I plotted the incremental cost of those regimens over the previously used regimen and the incremental gain in survival. So the survival gains on the x-axis and the incremental cost, just the drug cost, not a true cost effect in this study, uh, in uh, here. So what's the pattern here? Pretty hard to tell. Well, then what I did is I grouped it by when these products were approved. And the products that were approved uh, on this, in this blue area here, were all, were all adopted, I should say, not approved, were, were adopted in the late 90s, early 2000s. These products were adopted in the mid-2000s, and these were in the, you know, the more recent years. And what you can see is over time, the costs um, are increasing, increasing, but the incremental gains in survival, there's no, there's no obvious pattern. It's just the costs of the drugs are increasing regardless of the incremental benefit. You can see a large incremental benefit here or larger, uh, much lower incremental benefits here, but the costs are consistently higher. This is a study I pu published uh, with a colleague of ours um, in uh, the Journal of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network looking at the costs of um, regimens that are recommended by the NCCN guidelines. Uh, this is, these are guidelines for metastatic gastric cancer, and these are five regimens that NCCN says we think these all have good evidence. We won't make a specific recommendation other to say than to say that all of these regimens can be used for patients with metastatic gastric cancer. And we just took the uh, mythical average Medicare reimbursement uh, for those and tallied it up. And you can see the difference 
in survival here is, uh, is quite, uh, quite the same. I mean, there's very little difference between the greatest survival and the lowest survival. But there is a pretty big difference in the cost of these regimens. So this one, yes, it is less convenient. Uh, it may have uh, some uh, side effects that are different from the others, um, but it costs $840 versus uh, a combination of oral therapies that costs, uh, at least currently, almost $60,000. And NCCN says, you choose, no difference. So what we have uh, is a disconnect between what I think would be the ideal and is the real. And I just wanted to close by mapping it out for you. Um, this is really an approach that I think uh, the Europeans uh, have adopted and are doing reasonably well, uh, where they use health economics and outcomes research uh, as part of health technology in cancer therapy. And they follow a pretty prescribed protocol where new cancer therapy is developed, um, it is introduced, um, there is a, 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 um, an effort to understand the clinical context, the prevalence of the disease, the practice patterns, uh, patient reported outcomes, and the comparative effectiveness of the new product versus what is done uh, currently. Um, there is an attempt to put together a comprehensive cost effectiveness analysis based on that clinical context which is then translated into professional recommendations and practice guidelines, uh, and finally transmitted into uh, clinical practice. And if you go to the UK, if you go to Australia, if you go to Canada, Netherlands, this is really the approach they take for evaluating uh, and their payer systems adopting and paying for uh, new therapies in oncology. In the US, we have a different model uh, where we develop cancer therapies we put them into clinical practice after they're approved uh, by the FDA, and then we watch what happens. We, we understand the clinical practice, the context, by what happens uh, in terms of their diffusion, uh, in terms of practice patterns, uh, and measuring what happens to patients, uh, really in an ad hoc uh, mesh, uh, method. We bypass, bypass cost effectiveness analysis uh, completely, um, and then based on that clinical context and experience, usually after the fact, professional guidelines uh, and recommendations are put together. But by then, the practice patterns have been in many ways cemented, uh, and it's very hard to undo the, um, the diffusion that has happened. So the question I think uh, that we've been talking about uh, all day today is will the change in our payment paradigms change the health economics and outcomes research paradigm? In other words, will it make, make health economics more relevant? And my short answer is, is I'm not certain. Uh, I look at all of these schemes, such as value-based pricing, accountable care organizations, oncology medical homes, pay-for-performance schemes. They're all fine, but they are all schemes that, to me, distribute risk between payers, uh, patients, and provider networks. There is no risk that I see that spills over into the manufacturer community, the people who are making the products who are setting the prices. It's almost as if we're taking those as given and trying to find ways to sort of spread it around so that the pain is, is minimized to any one group. But to my mind, that doesn't create any incentives for pharma or other manufacturers uh, to pay attention to price. And in fact, I think it encourages them to be more bold in terms of uh, increasing price. So I think as a community, we need very soon to talk about this issue of where health economics fits into the HEOR paradigm um, or else uh, you know, radical things, problems are going to happen. We're going to have to stop giving certain patients access. We're going to, you know, oncology practices are going to go bankrupt. Patients are going to go bankrupt. Um, it's just not a supportable system. Um, and so my closing comment is that I think we need to put the HE back into HEOR and figure out ways as a community for using that as a leverage point for breaking the current price trend in oncology. Thank you.